sing praise. morning you're doing well are you ready to worship the king of kings I invite you to stand we are going to lift the name of jesus on high because he is so good and he is so faithful we're so glad to see you thank you for joining us this morning and to those online so father god we love you we look to you here we are ready to worship you to give you all the praise all the glory all the honor you are so so good let us worship and sing to our God. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Break it. 
I love that song. God, you do great things. You know, we serve the real and living God. We don't have a religion. We don't have an ideology. We have a relationship with the living God. And God does great things in every one of our lives. Let's worship. Let's give the Lord a big walk, a big hand clap. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We love you this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Keep them brief. Uh, uh, Tuesdays with Stuart Leatherdale. It's called some TNT. That's because they're dynamite. And uh, we're starting a, uh, a new uh, series, and it'll be starting this Tuesday. I believe it's on the book of Joel. I had it written down, but I misplaced it. But it's going to be good. So if you want to come out to a good Bible study, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock with Stuart TNT. You know, we're having a missions conference. I like what Jesus said to his disciples. He, d he said, don't say in four months will be the harvest. I mean, you look outside right now, and it's cold, and it's snowy, and you're saying, you know what, there's no harvest right now unless you're harvesting snow. That would make it snow good. But he's talking about people. Today is the day of salvation. The harvest is right. We're having Bill and Tammy Woods from Chiapas, Mexico. They have an orphanage. They are coming to impart their vision and ministry for missions. And it's not about going to Mexico. That's what they do. But the, the theme of the conference is the Beautiful Feet Conference, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of him or her that brings good news. Friday night, they're going to tell their story of how God called them, the things they made and the mistakes they did, and, and the exciting, dynamic journey of trusting Jesus. Saturday morning, Tammy is going to take speak on God will make a way. And then Bill will speak on power, evangelism, and missions. And Sunday morning, It'll be called to go. Do you know that we're all on missions? You're going to want to hear this couple. They are dynamic. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They have many miracles, and they want to impart to you what they've received. So I encourage you to sign up. It'll be the first weekend in March 4th, 5th, 6th. Uh, there's no charge for the conference. Friday night, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. I hope you'll join us. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you that you are with us, you are for us. Yes, Lord. Your 
Lift our voice. Whoa. I will praise you on the mountains. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the sun that will wear my feet out. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God. Of heaven. 
There before the throne of grace Majesty before my eyes I let it take my breath away Father God, we look to you. We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You are worthy of our praise. We thank you for what you did on the cross, Jesus, that we could have eternal life, everlasting life, that it doesn't end here, but it goes on for eternity, Jesus. We look forward to the day that we get to stand before you. God, you are so good. We sing a thousand hallelujahs to you, Jesus, and a thousand more hallelujahs.
We sing a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand hallelujahs more. You are worthy. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lamb. You are risen. You are seated on high, Lord. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the kingdom of God comes by participation, not by observation. So this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to participate. I want you to repeat after me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lord. We glorify you, Lord. Lord. Now we're going to do that one more time, and this time we're going to say it like it's that day. Do you know what day I'm talking about? That day. That day when we will see him, when we will be transformed and become like him. Are you ready? Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you who are with us online, good morning. For those of you who are visiting this morning, welcome. And for those of you who are still checking us out and seeing what's happening here and are curious about the things that God is doing in this place, we say again to you, Good morning. And for those of you who faithfully participate every week in what God is doing here in this place, thank you, God bless you, and welcome back. Amen. Well, this morning I would like to talk about what it means to live a Christ-centered life. We're going to open up with Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects and bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I believe that God has a plan, a blueprint, if you will, for our lives, and it's found in these pages. God's blueprint, God's plan for our lives is found right here. These blueprints teach us how to live our lives. They teach us how to treat each other. And they teach us how we are called to relate to a powerful, omniscient, living God. In terms of church, these pages show us how the church is to be built and structured and governed in a way that glorifies him, in a way that is orderly, and in a way that brings order. You know, God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. But he's also a God of order. And I believe that God has an order for doing things. And he has an order for us to do things. I'd like to examine this morning, first, the word order. As a noun, the word order means to arrange or the disposition of a people or things in relationship to each other according to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. So the word order infers sequences, patterns, and methods. A method is how to do something in a prescribed way that will achieve a very specific result. God has a way for us to do things 
that will achieve a very specific result. And his word is filled with patterns and sequences in which for us to build our lives, which when if done properly will bring forth a very specific and intended result. As a verb, the word order infers an authoritative command, direction, or instruction. Do you know that his word is full of commands and instructions and direction? Jesus gives us many commands. He gives us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, day by day, direction for our lives and instruction when, if heeded to properly, will bring forth a very specific and intended result. Everything that we do must be for one purpose in the kingdom of God, and that is to glorify him. So what's this method? What are these patterns? Well, I believe that we have one particular pattern that we adhere to a lot in this church, and that's that whenever we do anything, whatever we build, whatever we teach, whatever we create, we always ask a few very important questions. Number one, God, is this the right thing? God, what is the right way to do this? Is this the right time? And Lord, we need your help because we can't do anything unless you have laid it before us and you are with us cooperating to bring glory to that thing. The proof that we've followed his pattern and done things according to his design always brings forth glory. Do you know when Noah was given instructions, patterns, designs, blueprints to build the ark, and he did it according to God's pattern, God filled it with his glory and saved Noah and his family, ultimately the human race. God gave Moses a blueprint, a pattern, a sequence, instruction, direction on how to build the tabernacle. And when Moses built the tabernacle according to his plan, God filled it with his glory. Solomon was given instructions on how to build the glorious temple that God would dwell in. He was given design plans, blueprints, patterns, direction, and God filled the temple with his glory. Paul said he was a wise master builder and that he was given revelation concerning the cornerstone upon which the house should be built speaking of the church, and he said, Jesus Christ must be the cornerstone. And he said, I have been given the blueprints, the designs, the plans to build the church. And he said, if you build it according to the patterns and the designs that you see in us and that you receive from us, God will fill it, the church, with his glory. If we as individuals will build our lives upon the cornerstone rock, which is Jesus Christ, and follow his instruction, his patterns, his designs, following his methods, we as individuals will be filled with his glory. If we do things, I believe, in our lives, in, in our church, according to the way 
And Jesus said, I am the way. If we do things his way, according to his due order, I believe they should reflect the very nature of heaven. This morning, I'd like to continue unpacking what is our church vision. Do you know our vision here at Open Door Christian Fellowship is to see a Christ-centered community growing together in faith, hope, and love. So what does it mean to be a Christ-centered individual? What does it mean to be a Christ-centered church? To be Christ-centered is to be ever conscious and mindful of him. It is to be more conscious of him than ourselves. More conscious of him than our plans, our ambitions, our ideas, our agendas, more conscious of him than our problems, more conscious of him than our hurts and our offenses. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, where he is seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And the more conscious we are of him, the more conscious we are of him, the more we will become like him. And the more we become like him, the more we will begin to take on his character and likeness. See, there's a lot of pretending in the body of Christ. A lot of people pretending to be godly. A lot of people pretending to be holy. But that's not how the process of sanctification takes place. See, if you're striving to be like Jesus, you will miss the mark. If you're striving to be holy, you will never be holy enough. If you're striving to be good, you will never be good enough. The only way to enter into this plan, the only way to follow this method is to keep our eyes on him. And as we keep our eyes on him, as we spend time with him, we will become like him. Three scriptures that validate this idea. Number one, Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with wise men will himself be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 22 says, do not associate with a man given to anger. Don't follow along with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways. And you will find a snare for yourself. That was Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. He says... The people you come into contact with, you will become like. You will become like those that you associate with. Our vision is for a Christ-centered community where the character of Christ is seen, where the character of Christ is felt, where the character of Christ is known and reflected where the character of Christ is experienced. Worship is important. Preaching and teaching of the gospel is important. Youth ministries, children's ministries, men's ministries, all of these ministries are important. But to what end? If the character of Christ is not truly being formed in us, then what are we doing? 
God's desire is to form us into his image. This happens in worship. This happens in small group ministries. This happens through the preaching and the teaching of the word. But those are not the things. Those are ends that are used to meet the end goal, which is to be made into the likeness of Christ. The character of Christ is what we want to be known for as individuals and as a church. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that if we're doing things God's way, if worship, if programs, if ministries, if the very atmosphere of this place is done according to God's way, again, I believe it will reflect and should reflect and should be a very small slice of what it will be like in heaven. That, that is, I believe that is God's intention for the community of church to begin to give us a foreshadowing of what heaven will be like. And when we do church, God's way, this will be the intended result. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. What is the will of God? First Thessalonians says, It is our sanctification. Romans 8, 29 says, Those for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. This is his will, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Luke 17, verse 20 begins to show us what our part is in living the Christ-centered life and making a contribution to a Christ-centered community. This is very simple. Now listen carefully. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, Jesus answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. I opened the message up this morning saying, the kingdom of God is about participation, not observation. Spiritual maturity and character does not come upon us with some kind of shazam, super Christian moment. The kingdom of God is something that unflowers in our lives through time and through participation as we co-labor with him, becoming all that he wants us to become is a process. There is no magic formula in the kingdom. There are no fast passes onto this ride. You have to line up and go through the queue and experience the whole show before the show. And if you know what I'm talking about, and you've been to Disney, you know that some of those lines are more exciting than the ride themselves. Yeah? There's a whole show going on. But guess what? The Fast Pass, they don't get the show. They just get on the ride. You don't get all the Disney magic that happens along the way. And that's kind of like life. There's magic that happens all along the way. We're not supposed to be racing to the end goal. We're supposed to be savoring him and enjoying him moment by moment in the process, through the process. Amen. Amen. There's none of this uh, hang on and hold on to the end of the ride. Maybe we're going to get through this together and then come Lord Jesus. If that is your mentality, if that's your perspective, you are missing the show that's unfolding. You are missing the glory that's unfolding. You are missing the excitement of life 
as it unfolds. Yeah, there's crazy things happening out there. Hello. We know that. But guess what? None of it matters if our eyes are on Jesus. When our eyes fall off of him and start to focus on the problems and start to focus on the issues and start to focus on the people, we miss the glory and we miss being part of the glory and we miss receiving the glory. Proverbs 24, sorry, 12, 24 says, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. Are you waiting on God to change you? Or are you cooperating with him each day? You know, if we remain spiritually passive, we are going to come under the heavy labor and the bondage of sin. But if we're diligent and faithful to cultivate the land that God has given to us, we will experience a fruitful life, a fruitful life full of love and joy and peace. And we will live victoriously in him. You know, Christ came not only to save us from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin over our lives and to restore man's original purpose, which was to be fruitful. You're right. You're right. He did to the, into the image of God and to bear fruit. He said, go and be fruitful. Christ came so that we would not only live victorious lives, but fruitful lives. Galatians chapter five, verse 16 says, I say, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These things are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, all of these things, he says, I forewarn you just as I have that if you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he says the fruit of the Spirit, though, the fruit of the Spirit, though, is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness, self-control. And against these things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. My question to you this morning is, is your life full of love? Is your life full of joy and peace? Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you gentle? Are you faithful? Does your life reflect a measure of self-control? This is the evidence that the character of Christ is being formed in us. This is the evidence that we are living a Christ-centered life. This is the evidence that we are part of a Christ-centered church. When we see these things, when we taste these things, when we experience these things all around us, it's a reminder that we're doing things God's way. Many Christians live unfulfilled, unfruitful, unhappy lives because they have become disillusioned by the Christian life. They thought that if they did this, they would get this because their motives and their assumptions were incorrect. They weren't living lives with an eternal focus in mind. And this leads to further frustration and further striving and further disillusionment. So how do we stay Christ-centered and maintain our vitality? How do we know that we're living a Christ-centered life? Again, let's take a look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the words of which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he will be thrown away as a branch and dried up, and they'll gather them and cast them into the fire to be burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this thing, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Amen. Okay, I lost my spot. Where are we? I'll read it off here. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Amen. Amen. We must continue to abide. And we know we are abiding by the fruit that our lives are producing. Listen, it's all about the fruit. Are your lives producing sweet, juicy fruit that is both savory and appealing to those around you? Or is your life producing, as I've said before, something resembling more of sour grapes and rotten peaches? The fruit that we produce is a reflection of our spiritual maturity. It's a seasonal barometer, if you will, letting us know how we measure up. The Bible says that we will know a tree by its fruits. And you know what? Fruit, the fruit that we produce has three purposes. Number one, the fruit that we produce is intended to glorify the Lord. Number two, the fruit that we produce is intended to nourish other people around us and to provoke them to desire him. And number three, the spiritual fruit that we produce is also intended to nourish us. Do you know there's a lot of mental health issues in our society right now? But the Bible says that if we will abide in him, we will have peace of mind. We will have joy in our hearts. That we will have love flowing through this. Do you know what? That has got to be one of the best medications for mental health issues. Jesus is a healer. And when he abides in us, his health is manifested through us. The Lord spoke through the Apostle Paul about a test. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test. And I believe that one of these tests is the fruit test. It's not about what you know, it's not about who you know, but it's about how you taste. How do you taste? Is your life sweet and savory? Is it nourishing to other people around you? Or are you sour grapes and rotten peaches? Are people around us on pins and needles all the time? Are people around us feeling judged, nervous, criticized? 
Do you know, life in the church should not be about how efficient we are, but how fruitful we are. And the real question we must ask ourselves is this. Are we representing Christ well to others? How do other people around us feel? Do they feel loved? Do they feel valued? Do they feel encouraged? Are the people in your family, are the people in your workplace, are the people you're sitting beside this morning, do they feel loved? Do they feel built up, encouraged? Are we ministering faith, hope, and love to all those that come into contact with us? This is the call. This is our commission. And this morning, I want to ask you to join with me in saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will. The Bible says that one day we will meet him face to face. And every day from today until that day is about preparing our hearts for him and his arrival and to be united with him. And on that day, we will say, yes, Lord, I do. Yes, Lord, I will. Again, will you join with me today in saying yes to love, yes to righteousness, yes to forgiveness, yes to holiness, yes to laying down our lives for one another, yes to letting go of hurt pasts and offenses, yes to living for him today, tomorrow, and forever. This I believe is what it means to be Christ-centered. This is what it means to live a Christ-centered life, and this is what it means to be part of a Christ-centered church. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you this morning that you are the wise master builder, that you are the gardener, And we know this morning, Lord, that it is your desire to bring fruitfulness into our lives, to bring fruitfulness into our church. And we thank you, Lord, that you are and that you have and that you are going to continue to do this. We thank you, Lord God, for the leadership that you've placed in this church. We thank you, Lord God, for the teachings that you've given to us to build our lives on. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation. We thank you, Lord, for the musicians. We thank you, Lord, for the technology. We thank you, Lord, for one another and what you are doing in this place and in our lives. And this morning, we say to you, hallelujah. This morning we say to you, praise the Lord. This morning we say to you, we glorify you and we exalt your holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you stand and let us sing and worship. You know that there is joy in this place because Jesus is in this place. Amen. So let us sing. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are, Lord. Would our lives be fruitful, God? Would people see and um, would we be the salt and light, Jesus? Would people meet us and know that there's something different and that difference is you, Lord? So we love you and let's sing.
Good to be with you this morning. I heard little sweet cherub voices from the back of the church, and we're so glad to have children in this church. I also saw some parents take out some of those little sweet cherub voices. And I just want to remind people, if your kid's talking, everybody was great, but I just want to remind you, please, for the sake of those around you, please just take out your children. You can go into the foyer and hear the message. And when they settle down, please bring them back. We're so happy you're here. I hope you don't mind me just giving you a little gentle reminder. We absolutely love you. We're so grateful you're here. And uh, we're going to close in prayer. It's so good to be together. You know, I'm excited. I believe and I'm praying for the restrictions to completely end soon. No limitations. Because I want to see you face to face, not face to mask. Hallelujah. God is good. And uh, we're going to pray. Uh, we have our prayer team. They're going to come and pray for you. If someone has a hip problem, I believe God wants to touch you this morning specifically. But if you have any problem, please come and, and ask for prayer. We love you all. So good to be with you this morning. Lord, I thank you. What a privilege to be with such a wonderful group of people that we can celebrate Jesus together. And I just pray, oh God, for your blessing upon this week. Give them join the journey. Lord, we know life at times can be very hard, but we declare God is always good. Thank you for Jason's message about a Christ-centered life. And Lord, now I pray that you'll give me a different message this week because that was the one I was going to preach. So Lord, thank you that you're a creative God. There's no limit. I know I'm limited, but you're not. God bless you. Lord be with you. Love you all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.